So blood pressure is probably one of the most important uh, health targets. Uh, of course, there are others like nutrition. But blood pressure is such a primordial kind of force that uh, to keep it under good control is necessary for certainly long, healthy living and health of all organ systems. And when we sleep, blood pressure has very predictable changes. It drops, so-called blood pressure dipping. And whether the dipping is independently beneficial or not, one thing is clear that if we do not have this dip at night, uh, it results in uh, abnormal uh, long-term heart function, kidney function, brain function, and so on. So the normal blood pressure profile is a drop during sleep, which is completely disrupted when sleep is abnormal from any reason. Insomnia, restless legs, sleep apnea, and so on. But apnea itself is remarkably good at making blood pressure abnormal. And there are two fundamental mechanisms. One is that each awakening, each arousal from sleep, you have a surge in blood pressure. Besides that, the low oxygen levels, which often occurs with apnea, sensitizes the breathing control system and results in increased sympathetic activity, which raises blood pressure. In fact, uh, experiments done in the 80s showed that if you take rats and you expose them to severe drops in oxygen, uh, they will reliably uh, develop high blood pressure. But if you... Uh, uh, destroy the sensing system for oxygen in relation to sympathetic nerve activity, they do not develop it. Wow. This effect takes time. So it's not instantaneous in both directions. So when you treat, it usually takes time for a resetting. And when you develop apnea, I mean, we tend to hear the stories of those who have sewer apnea. But apnea often starts in childhood. So it has a long time to develop and undergo so-called neuroplastic changes, where the circuitry actually changes, gets rewired. So while we're sleeping, if you have sleep apnea untreated, you have surges of blood pressure, like a hammer a whacking away at the system. And the brain has a lot of what's called autoregulation. It's able to buffer itself from blood pressure fluctuations, but ultimately it breaks down. Uh, in some ways, it's surprising that more people don't have strokes. That's because the autoregulation is so good. But when it breaks down, the risk of stroke is very real. And uh, unfortunately, it really happens often enough. There is actually a large clinical trial which is ongoing, uh, funded by the, I believe it's the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Mm -hmm. And it's 40-odd uh, centers. It's based out of the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to use auto CPAP soon after a stroke versus right. standard care. Right. And uh, I believe the outcomes are going to be looked at six months, three months, to see whether it can prevent further strokes as well as improve uh, stroke outcomes. Now, it's going to take many years for this to come through. But if it's positive, that will completely change the way we manage strokes. So after a stroke, apnea is really very common. And this is argument whether, you know, what caused what. Uh, but clearly, when you have apnea, there is so much perturbation of physiology. It just can't be a good thing for any part of the body, never mind a brain which has just been impacted and uh, partly destroyed. So I'm optimistic, certainly hopeful, that this study will show uh, reasonable benefits. Uh, and it'll actually be part of uh, clinical practice. Uh, it is clearly important to um, think of sleep apnea in younger individuals with stroke, or for that matter, cardiac arrhythmias, uh, because there are very few obvious treatable conditions for high blood pressure, atrial fibrillation, stroke in young individuals. And sleep apnea is already on the list in textbooks. It's unfortunate that in clinical practice, it rarely seems to be getting translated. Uh, good sleep has a lot of cardioprotective effects. Uh, there is uh, so-called vagal dominance, where you have the vagal system rather than sympathetic system uh, strongly activated with good sleep. You have uh, blood pressure dipping, which is good. 
there are probably anti-arrhythmic effects. There are desirable metabolic effects, anti-inflammatory effects. So good sleep is generally just a good thing for the heart. It's really very interesting to note that for a wide range of cardiac disorders, sleep apnea seems to be a very common association. That's true for atrial fibrillation. It's very true for heart failure, of course. It's probably true for congenital heart disease. You know, unfortunately, measuring sleep has always been difficult and somewhat mysterious. You know, sleep lab, a lot of leads on your head, etc. But that's no longer true. Technology now really allows you to very easily measure the basics of sleep, both um, medical grade and consumer grade. Uh, soon, hopefully, sooner rather than later, everybody will know how well they are sleeping. Uh, and you don't have to go to a doctor to know that. Just like you stand on a bathroom scale to know your weight, there's no reason why you should not know how well you're sleeping. It could be, <clears throat> it could be oximetry based. It could be based on other signals. But the oximeter itself, it really encodes a lot of sleep information. Not just oxygen, but also there's you know heart rate information and so on. Similarly, many smart watches probably can do it, but they don't want to unleash it because they have to get through the FDA. So snoring is so common that it's really not practical to chase every snorer. Now, clearly, if you have high quality home testing for sleep quality and apnea, and then it becomes a bit of a mood point. But given what we have today, if you are snoring, it's something else, uh, poor sleep quality, fatigue in the daytime, or you witness apneas, that is, you notice that it's not just snoring, but they're actually stoppages. Uh, that is certainly reasonable uh, to, you know, to follow through. Uh, unfortunately, about a third of patients with substantial apnea have no daytime symptoms. It's quite a mystery, in fact. It's a bit like uh, you cut, but you do not bleed. Uh, even in the sleep clinic, we find occasional patients with just a lot of apnea, but just minimal to no symptoms. It's quite a mystery, but it's real. So for such a person, unless you have some objective testing, you may just not pick it up. But otherwise, if you wake up unrefreshed constantly, tired in the daytime, need to take naps, someone notices that you're, you know, stopping to breathe. If you're clearly obese, uh, those are uh, likely, you know, reasons to pursue. It is still a schlep to get it. You know, you still have to go to the dog, get the test. I mean, it is not made easy at all, unfortunately. We are, we are kind of guilty of that, the sleep field, of not making it easy enough to ask a fairly simple question. Do I have apnea or not? And if there is, is it something which I need to pursue or not?